Hello, and welcome to the Payoff Pitch Podcast presented by BetMGM. We are Action Network's Major League Baseball betting podcast. I'm Sean Zerillo, joined today by BJ Cunningham and Jim Turvey. We're going to help you break down some of our favorite player props for the 2024 MLB season. We're going to talk about other things in the coming weeks, divisional previews, our favorite bets in general, a long shots podcast where we're going to give you stuff over 100 to 1, and more right here on Payoff Pitch. So make sure to tune in throughout the preseason be subscribed. And throughout the season, we're going to drop new episodes every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. So make sure to look out for those as well, wherever you get your podcast. For today's episode, though, as I said, we're going to dive into player props and we're going to do it in a fun way by taking a snake draft. First, I want to check in on the guys. BJ, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful, Sean. You know, baseball season's right on the corner. Spring training is in full swing right now. The weather here in Iowa is starting to get a little bit warmer. The farmers are about to start planting that beautiful corn that we see at, you know, Field of Dreams every single year. But I'm just excited for this baseball season. You know, maybe it's because I cover, you know, uh, college football and European soccer, but it's a very top heavy season. You know, it's who can knock off the Dodgers, who can potentially down them and win the World Series. It feels very eerily similar to 2009 when the Yankees bought their World Series. So it's going to be a fun year. I think it's going to make it a very compelling season of who can actually beat the Dodgers. And I'm excited for it. Yeah, no field. The Dreams game in Iowa this year. I believe they're yeah. doing it at Rickwood Field in Alabama. Uh, we also have the Korea Series coming up on March 20th. That'll get the Major League season started. And Major League Baseball also, I believe, heading to London and Mexico City this year. So number of fun parks that I get to handicap the park factors on. Individual game previews that I get to tie up my week's writing. But looking forward to baseball and all these new and fun venues in 2024. Jim, you excited for this MLB season? I can't wait. You know, it's not it's not really baseball weather yet here in uh, New York, but but I can say I have yeah I've been deep in these these MLB futures for a little while now. You know, I'm a, I'm a big basketball guy as well, but my my first love was was baseball, and you know I think I I kind of keep that love keep that fire burning with uh, the futures. They're really you know the day to day is 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 really tough. I you know I'm I'm sitting here with two of the best at it, but for me those futures they kind of you know, go the full season, you're able to just kind of day in and day out, watch stuff with maybe a, a little bit less of the, the, the every night, you know, cranking the cranking out bets until midnight, you know, you get that future, you just kind of follow it all season. So this is this is definitely my favorite time of year for baseball uh, betting. Yeah, I liken it to betting on a golf tournament, except you get to bet on 15 different golf tournaments and you don't get to see the <laughs> mm-hmm. results for seven months. Uh, it's, you know, all these different leaderboards trying to find where the value might lie, but the range of odds that you have and finding ways to project guys who are misbucketed or bucketed incorrectly relative to the other guys that are around on the odds board. I think that's part of the fun for me, the hunt, you know, the, the enjoyment of the hunt of finding the value is definitely uh, part of the fun, but we're going to try to help you skip a portion of that work and a portion of the diving that we have to do through 20 plus different sports books to look at the odds for the <laughs> same player to win the same category. We found the best odds for you. If you want to find where we bet these bets, you can find all of our bets tracked in the Action Network app. Make sure to follow myself, BJ, and Jim. We'll be posting futures throughout the remainder of the preseason and then getting your bets as we get into these day-to-day games. We're going to do a snake draft here, though, as I mentioned, to determine our favorite player props for 2024. We may have some overlap. I may have to change my picks on the fly, but since I'm in control of the wheel here, I'm going to get things started off first. And basically, since I have the first pick, this comes down to which hill am I willing to die on for 2024? Which take do I have that I'm willing to stand on the corner for and scream to the heavens? Yoshinobu Yamamoto may be the best pitcher on the planet. I think he's definitely one of the five best pitchers on the planet. I think there's a chance he's the best of the best. I doubted him a little bit because of the size. I think a lot of people do. 5'10", 176 pounds. How can a guy that size hold up be so good at pitching throw 200 innings in a season well you only really need to throw 180 innings at this point in order to contend for a Cy Young Blake Snell uh Spencer Strider that's roughly what they hit last season Logan Webb Zach Allen crossed the 200 inning mark finished second and third respectively but basically 180 innings is the minimum that you need to approach with their six-man rotation there's a chance that Yamamoto doesn't throw quite as many innings as you would expect from a number one starter but he's very efficient And I do expect him to surpass that 180 inning mark. Now, I think the projections are underselling him a little bit here too. And that's scary 
because his whip projection across five different systems from zips to the bat has him between 0.97, as low as a 0.97 whip and 1.17. To me, Yamamoto, in terms of effectiveness, not in terms of the pitch mix, is prime Zach Greinke. I'm expecting something like 40 walks, 200 strikeouts, 2.5 ERA, 1.1 whip across about 180 innings. Spencer Strider should have more strikeouts. Uh, there's going to be other pitchers who are in the mix, you know, to surpass him in terms of innings pitch. Logan Webb should be at the 200 inning mark again. But the overall package for me, in terms of what Yamamoto is going to provide on a per inning basis, I expect him to be extremely efficient. The characteristics, you know, that we're using to measure Yamamoto, we actually have StatCast data from the World Baseball Classic last year. We also have limited StatCast data from spring training this year. Should immediately have the best split finger in, bas- in baseball, in basketball, in baseball. And number two, he has an elite fastball. And it's only 95 miles an hour. It doesn't necessarily pop off the page in terms of velocity. But his fastball is 18 inches of vertical break. And there's a very short list of pitchers, including Spencer Strider, who throw 95 plus miles an hour and also induce that much break vertically on their fastball. If you expand the list to 17 inches, Garrett Cole, Logan Gilbert, Yuri Perez, Blake Snell, Spencer Strider, it's a very short list including the Cy Young winners from last year. So Yoshinobu, Yoshinobu Yamamoto for me at 16 to one, I think he should be closer to nine to one or 10 to one to win the National League Cy Young. I think he's a prohibitive favorite in terms of the National League Rookie of the Year. I would not bet that because I'd much rather have 16 to one on Cy Young than plus 180 on Rookie of the Year. But I do think he makes betting the NLROI category essentially prohibitive. So Yamamoto for me, the first overall pick to win the National League Cy Young, 16 to 1, like it down to about 12 to 1. BJ, you're up second, and you're going with the pitcher in the American League to win the Cy Young, who's one of my favorite targets for 2024. Yes, yeah, somebody who's also 16 to 1, available at widely available at most sports books, Tariq Skubal uh, of the Detroit Tigers, a guy who I know you guys will agree with me is about to make the leap into stardom. He's already kind of a star within the hardcore baseball community but to get to the mainstream i think we're really going to see him this season he made his first start last year on july 4th from july 4th on he posted a 3.3 war that was 0.8 higher than any other starting pitcher in major league baseball think about how insane that is that was 0.8 higher than strider than cole than everybody else and the way that he does it he doesn't have elite stuff you know his stuff plus is only sitting around 97 but he has elite command over his entire pitch arsenal 106 location plus 106 pitching plus since july 4th he changed up his pitch mix a little bit going from 2022 to 2023 he started to throw his change up a lot more often and it's become his most effective pitch he threw it around 25 percent of the time last year generated about a 50 percent whiff rate and now coming into spring training you know his last spring training start He was sitting consistently at 97, getting up to 98 miles per hour. He was only averaging about 95 and a half miles per hour in his fastball last season. So adding two more miles per hour to his fastball that was already generating a 25% whiff rate is going to make him even more tough for opposing hitters. So, you know, again, when you're betting these type of markets, I know Sean has identified this in his articles, but looking how guys do over the second half last season going into this is always a great indicator to see where you can find value in the MVP market. And he's already come down. I know, Sean, you bet him at 22 to 1. Again, he's 16 to 1 at most sports books. I've even seen him as low as 12 to 1. And I honestly wouldn't be that surprised if he closes around 12 to 1 uh, to win the Cy Young by the time we get to this. So if he plays a full season, having essentially an 11.4K per nine rate and a 1.5 walk per nine rate like he did last season, he's going to be right there in the conversation to win the Cy Young. Although the Tigers might not be in the playoffs, I mean, he's a guy who's going to take this leap into stardom this season. So if he stays healthy and he pitches a full season, he's definitely going to be up there as the one, two, or third best pitcher in the American League. Tremendous pitcher's park as well. My one concern is Scubo. He only tossed 80 innings last season, had an injury at the end of 2022. As I said, you basically need to get to 180 innings or so in order to contend for the Cy Young. Projection systems have him between 158 and 171. So you need him to hit the upper end of that projection, but that is what you're betting into when you're betting on a Cy Young category anyway. You need to bet the guy to win the pitch the full season if he's going to win the award. Jim, going to toss it to you third. Then you get to pick fourth as well. But in terms of your first pick here, you're actually going with a player total under for the season. 
Yeah, you guys gave out a, a pair of 16 to ones. I'm gonna give out a pair of actually minus money bets here. So th these are markets that I really like though. So these are the individual player markets where you can go in and bet uh, a specific stat, the over under for that stat. So this is really, it's a little bit more niche than, than your awards, than your league leaders. Um, but you can really kind of get into the nitty gritty on these. And they all, if you, if you shop across books, there are a lot of these out there. So if you, you know, hopefully you, you either have the time to do it or hopefully you're listening to this podcast and we did it for you. And we've, we've highlighted a few of our favorites. Um, last year, I, I picked out a few of these, did very well on them. Um, if you, because there are so many, if you, you know, you can hone in on a few that you really think the, the edge is the biggest and you pick out your favorites, um, this, this should be a pretty good market. So uh, I've actually got an under. Um, on a player's hits for my my first overall pick and then an over on a player's hits for my second overall pick. So let me start with the under. And that under is going to be Jazz Chisholm under 127 and a half hits. So Jazz Chisholm is a player who has not managed to stay healthy at all in his career. You know, he famously last season was saying he was going to, you know, play play in uh, all, all 162. He was, he, the, the health was there. He was going to do it. Fell a little bit short. Um, so this kind of centers around the idea that the projection systems kind of flatten out injuries concerns both ways. So if you have a you know very healthy player, they tend to bake in a little bit of health risk that it may be struggling to see just how healthy that player is. But if you have an incredibly poor health player like Jazz Chisholm, I, I find that it often struggles to project just how unhealthy that player is. So this, this number is relatively in line with most of his projections, but I personally see his his health projection much lower than a lot of the books. So he has at, he has missed an average of sixty eight point three games per season uh, the last three full seasons, you know, quote unquote full seasons. He has not made these full seasons. He's playing about um, you know under a hundred games a season. Even his uh, career high is only one hundred and twenty four games played. And he's also just not much of a guy to collect hits, even when he is in the lineup. Um, at his current rate of hits per game for his career, he'd have to play about 143 games to hit the over on this on this total. I do not, I, you know, there is a projection of him that he, in which he plays 143 games. I just don't think it's the, you know, 53rd percentile projection for, for Jazz for this season. So I think there's a, a significant edge here. Um, and that's honestly, he's, he's kind of outperformed his XBA this, uh, in his career to date. Now, part of that is he's the type of player who maybe with speed and his, his bad ball profile can, can outperform an XBA a little bit, but it gives us another route to, to securing this win. So even if he stays, say he plays 140 games this season, but he's a little bit unlucky, that's another way in which we can get the, the under on this bet. So there's a lot of outs on, on this Jazz Chisholm under. So I, I really like this as, as one of my favorite player props um, for the full season. On the, on the flip side of that, one of the players who I'm highest on um, and have bet him in several ways already, um, and, and I'm going to highlight here is Michael Harris II. His, uh, his hits prop is at 154 and a half, um, and I'm, I'm, I really like the, the over to that. So uh, Harris started last season with a really, really brutal start. So as of May 22nd, he had a 165, 238, 242 slash line, and had already missed 22 games. Um, after that, he was at 321, 352, 529, and only missed two games. He played the total of 110 of the final 112 games. Now, obviously, that's cherry picking a very specific date. I don't think we should project him to have necessarily, you know, that that 880 OPS going forward. But he's a lot closer to that than he is to the start of the season. He's also a guy who's only 22 years old still, and was, you know, we were all incredibly high on him last season, and. If, if we if we shave off just that little struggle to start the season that this this number looks very very low um he actually reached uh almost this number last season and even that was with you know this incredibly brutal start to the season so if he's able to stay healthy even relatively healthy if he had just um played about six more games he would have cleared it last season including that really rough start to the season so they're, they're, again, the kind of the inverse of jazz where there are multiple paths to getting the under with Harris, it feels like there are lots of paths to getting the over. Uh, one of those that I think is is potentially key to this and and uh, Sean, you and I were talking before the episode a little bit about even liking the ceiling on this in terms of a hits leader prop. Um, he he also has the chance here, you know, we've talked about Ronald Acuna looking like his knee is maybe a little shaky right now. He's going to see the doctor who did the surgery on it. 
Uh, Harris is a perfect fit to fill in at the top of that Braves lineup if Acuna does miss any time whatsoever. So if he's going from the bottom of the lineup where he's also already getting a decent number of plate appearances because of how strong that lineup is, he gets to the top of that lineup. I, I think he makes a really intriguing look for, you know, runs leader, hits leader, even, you know, some long shot MVP looks. Uh, he's a player who who I really am all over in a lot of ways. But if, if we're looking at just the the most simple approach to it, I and the most paths to victory, I really like this over uh, 154 and a half hits for Harris. Yeah, in complete agreement on Harris uh, and the Jazz angle as well, just in terms of Jazz's ability to stay healthy playing center field. You know, players get injured more playing center field, diving for balls than they do. Uh, Jazz twisted his ankle horribly last year as well. We were kind of making fun of that in April and May. He got better defensively, but there's just more ways to get injured in center field. In the same respect, yes, you could say the same for Michael Harris. But as you mentioned, Jim, there's a chance that he ends up atop this Braves lineup or maybe even hitting second behind Acuna at some point. In terms of how I project players out, hits per plate appearance, Harris is the fifth best player in baseball. Arias, Acuna, Bichette, Freeman, Michael Harris. So there's a chance that playing time goes up. I think he goes over that total with ease. And he was so much better in the second half of last season than he was in the first half, expecting a leap from Michael Harris the second in 2024. BJ, you're going with your second pick here, and you're stealing another pick for me, but that's perfectly yeah. okay because I like it quite a bit. Bobby Witt Jr., MVP at 20 to 1. I've seen even a little better out there as high as 23 to 1. Yeah, I I really like Bobby Witt here. So, you know, you obviously highlighted this in your article that over the second half of last season, Bobby Witt was second in war behind only Julio Rodriguez. And if you're looking for somebody like him or Julio Rodriguez who can get to that 40-40 club, I mean, he's going to steal 40-plus bases. He's one of the best base runners in all of baseball. Last season, he stole 49 bags. He had the highest sprint speed in baseball tied with Ellie De La Cruz. That is how fast he is. So he's an elite base runner. He also plays shortstop, a premium position, was top 10 in defensive rating, top 10 in outs above average. So he's a plus base runner and a plus defender. And he also hit 30 home runs, 97 RBIs last year. So, and if you look through all of his advanced metrics, he's 90th percentile or above in expected weighted on base average, expected batting average, expected slugging. You know, his barrel rate numbers, hard hit rate numbers could improve. But if you're looking for a guy who, again, over the last second half of last season was one of the best players in Major League Baseball, who was about to take this leap into complete stardom, I don't think there's really a better value on the board than Bobby Witt at 20 to one. I'd much rather bet him than a lot of guys that are above him in the board. So Bobby Witt 20 to one is probably one of my favorite bets for AL MVP. And one more thing about the American league MVP, there's no longer this guy that pitches and hits to take up the, the war leader. He's over playing with the Dodgers now. <laughs> so the American league MVP market is wide open, especially with Aaron Judge having a, a bad toe and some other guys below him, you know, potentially having a little bit of regression. I think Bobby Witt, who's going to be the known of the next stars in baseball, is fantastic value at 20 to 1. Unlike a lot of the other candidates in the AL2, Bobby Witt not fighting with any teammates for votes as well. Mm -hmm. You know, Judge and Soto potentially fighting for votes. It's kind of inconclusive in the history of MVP voting, whether that does hurt. Uh, guys, there's been instances where, like last year, Acuna finished first. You know, Riley, Olsen both finished top seven. There's instances, though, where you've had guys miss out on winning because of teammates. So there is a give and a take with that. But I agree completely on Bobby Witt Jr. Thought this number would be closer to 15 to 1 or even 12 to 1, considering his progression, considering the second half, considering where he's going in fantasy drafts and how popular of a player he is. Also plays a premium defensive position and got a lot better defensively last year, too. So seven win season within reach for Bobby Witt. We haven't seen his best season yet. That is terrifying. My prop number two, going with Grayson Rodriguez to win the American League Cy Young at 30 to 1. You probably knew this was coming. Yes, I probably have a man crush on Grayson, but it is with good reason. After his recall in July, and he was trying to throw a cutter during a large part of the season, absolutely getting hammered, went back to the minors, scrapped the cutter, changed his mix slightly, came back up in July, 126 stuff plus, 111 pitching plus, fourth and third respectively. He tossed 163 innings last season. No concerns about him getting the innings, 180, maybe even 200 plus, well within reach if he's efficient. He's adding a two-seam fastball to his mix this season as well. That should complement his four-seamer and his best pitch, which is his changeup. And there's pedigree there. 11th overall pick, former top pitching prospect. I expected to get 15-1 to on Grayson this year. We're getting double the price. 
all in on Grayson Rodriguez at 30 to 1. My favorite Cy Young bet in the American League alongside Yamamoto in the National League. And you probably knew this was coming too. Jordan Alvarez is the home run leader at 18 to 1. I think this is the best way, way to bet Jordan for 2024. Again, one of my favorite players. So there's going to be try, ways that I try to find to bet on Jordan, but this guy's 26 years old. We have not seen his peak season yet. The concerns here are injuries. He seems to get dinged up every season, had a hand injury to start last season, dealt with a knee injury in the middle of the year. He actually only homered nine times across 38 games in the middle of three months of the season. Still finished with 31 homers, was pacing closer to 45 home runs when he was healthy. There's a 50 home run season in here, and he raised this fly ball rate by 5% last season. Career 40%, actually raised it by 6% last season relative to his career average. So Jordan, for me, the peak is a triple crown and an AL MVP. Amongst the triple crown categories, you're getting the best odds on the home run leader or even compared to his MVP odds at 10 to 1, 18 to 1 on Jordan Alvarez to lead the majors in home runs this year. It's coming. I just don't know if it's going to be in 2024. Throwing it back to BJ, and I thought we were actually getting home run prop here, so I got a little bit excited that we could keep some consistency, but we're actually going back to the pitching department. BJ, you're going with a pitcher strikeout under for 20. Yeah, I'll have a home run prop here in a little bit, but yeah. uh, I like uh, Sonny Gray, another player total market. Sonny Gray under 170 and a half strikeouts. So if he is going to hit this over, either one of two things have to happen. Number one, he has to stay healthy and start over 30 plus games, which he has not done since 2019. And he has a history of injuring his right hamstring. And guess what? He's injured it three times since essentially 2020. And he just left his last spring training start with right hamstring tightness. So obviously it's still bothering him. He's 34 years old. So it's not like he's getting any younger. And secondly, he's going to have to maintain a nine plus 9.2, 9.3 K per nine rate over a full stretch of the season at that 30 plus start mark. He hasn't done that since he was with the Reds. Both seasons with the Twins, he was around 8.8 and 8.6 even last year, even though he was one of the better pitchers in baseball because he's become more of a ground ball pitcher, a pitcher that gets guys outs rather than getting through strikeouts. And he's honestly, another reason is because he's completely abandoned throwing a sinker. When he was with the Reds, that was the pitch that he got the most strikeouts with. Well, now he's basically only utilizing his sweeper as his main pitch to get a lot of those strikeouts. And it was really good last season. Had over 100 strikeouts with it, had over a you know 40% whiff rate on it. But if you're only utilizing that one pitch as your main strikeout pitch for a guy who's 34 years old and now becoming more of a ground ball pitcher, I think 170 is way too high. You know, if you look at uh, composite projections on fan graphs. And I wrote an article on this on the action network.com. If you want to read it with a bunch of different guys and their player totals using those composite projections on fan graphs, he's down around minus 155, minus 156 in that range. So he's got to stay healthy and he's got to improve his K per nine rate into the nine plus range when he's projected for a K per nine rate closer to 8.5 on composites. So Sonny Gray under 170 and a half strikeouts, I think is far too high for him. Before we move on for Jim's third and fourth round picks, I just want to mention the great state of North Carolina is launching sports betting this Monday, March 11th. So if you're in the Tar Heel State, take advantage of the best sign-up offers across every sports book. You can find a link to every one of those offers in the description of this episode. All the North Carolina offers in one place. Just check out the link in the episode description. Jim, tossing it to you for your third and fourth round pick. You're going to talk about a player that BJ and I were just on in round two. Tell me why Bobby Witt Jr. is leading Major League Baseball in hits this season. Yeah, I love when uh, the the group is in lockstep, and I think uh, the three of us are right there together on on Bobby Witt Jr. and and what we see as a potential you know breakout to a breakout season. Like he he improved greatly in his sophomore season, and he kind of quietly did have an outstanding season. He was he finished eighth um, in the league in hits last season. And that was honestly with a little bit of bad luck. Uh, he had a BABIP that was about 15 points below his projected uh, BABIP and uh, an average that was about 20 points below his XBA. So that, and that's coming in a stadium that has kind of quietly turned into a pretty offensive friendly stadium out there, especially for hits in general. Uh, they've got that big, big outfield there at Kaufman. 
Um, and this is a player that I'm all over in, in many ways. I'm, I'm on going to be on MVP with you guys as well. Um, and I, I just love betting his 90th percentile outcome. And for me, this is my favorite way to, to target that 90th percentile for, for Bobby Witt. He's, he's coming in at 25 to one to lead the league in hits right now. Um, if you, if you look at the bat X projections right now, which are maybe my favorite projections to look out, look at right now, they have him projected for the third most hits in all of baseball this season. Um, and that includes being behind Ronald Acuna Jr., who we already talked about, already has a potential injury concern. So really, it's it's Freddie Freeman who's above him in terms of in terms of this projection. So it, it, getting this number, you know, he is not nearly third in in the actual odds. We've got some guys like Luis Arias, who you know, at a in a per game basis, is likely uh, ahead of Witt in most projections. But Witt is a guy who's consistently stayed on the field. He's young. He's over a decade younger than Freddie Freeman. Now, Freddie Freeman has been incredibly healthy, incredibly consistent his whole career. But Witt is a guy who, you know, projection systems can struggle a little bit at times at extremes, right? And and sometimes those extremes act as leaps. You know, a player going into his third season, uh, you know, obviously there is the, the baked in overall uh, improvement from a second to third year player. But sometimes, you know, those don't look all the same. And so I think targeting a player like Witt, who is as incredibly talented as he is, as young as he is, as fresh as he is, to, to hit a, a high percentile outcome is something I really like to target. And, and my favorite market to do it here is, is hits at 25 to one. Um, and then on the flip side of that is a player who is, you know, maybe not on the, the young and fresh and uh, non-injured part of his career. And that's Chris Bryant. I'm looking at under 19 and a half home runs for Chris Bryant. This is a guy who, you know, when he broke on the scene was kind of like a Bobby Witt. He was kind of the, the next face of baseball. And on those Cubs teams, we all remember him as an incredibly important part of the the team that that broke the curse. Uh, but he he's not the same player these days, unfortunately. It's really sad to see for a guy who I think a lot of us liked back back when he was on the Cubs. But he he's kind of quietly just kind of faded into oblivion in Colorado. He's missed over 200 games combined in the last two seasons. And, you know, he's 32, but he's looking like a very old 32 at this point. Um, Colorado is the team that I think is by far the worst in baseball. There's no reason to push him into playing through any injuries he picks up. That's how they've handled it the last two seasons. Now, maybe, you know, they have a more active front office now. Maybe they'll look to flip him. I'm not sure how many teams would really be looking to pick up a Chris Bryant right now. So if we if we project him for this season in Colorado, he, the, the power drop off has been very notable for him as well. He's only played uh, 122 games as a Rocky the last two seasons. He has just 15 home runs. So even if we take a fully healthy season of him, which again, I don't think is the, the 52.8th percentile outcome to cover this, this minus 110 that, that we're betting into here. He doesn't even get to 20 homers that way. So he would need to increase his, his power in, in that's been trending in the wrong direction for years now. And he'd need to stay healthy, which has also been trending in the wrong direction. So I, I can't get to this number. Now, maybe the, the, the route to and over is either, you know, he's, he is sent out of Colorado or he is able to, you know, he is only 32. So maybe there, some of those were just tough injury years. I just think that with these, again, with these player props, you're not, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a lock. It doesn't have to be a hundred percent outcome. It just has to be, you know, better than 52.8%. And I, I, I see this, this Chris Bryant prop going uh, under 19 and a half more often than not this season. So that's one of my favorite player props as well. The power is gone. If you look at maximum exit velocity, I think max EV is the best overall indicator for power upside. Max EV for Bryant the last couple of years, 108 miles an hour. Uh, at his peak, he was hitting the ball 113. And a guy like Jordan is closer to 117. He's nowhere near the category of players who hit 25, 30 home runs in terms of maximum exit velocity. Obviously been injured the past couple of years. If he comes out the first week of the season and blasts the ball 113 miles an hour, Pretty good confidence that Chris Bryant is back to a different level than he was previously. But I think Max EV, a very good measurement of a player's power potential. And Bryant hasn't hit the ball over 110 miles an hour in a couple of years. So very concerning there in terms of the health for the rest of his career. BJ, you're going with a home run prop as well. Also an under, and it's a player yeah. who I bet is the home run leader for 2023. So mm -hmm. curious to see why you like Matt Olson's under this year. Matt Olson under 43 and a half home runs. Before I get started, I have a trivia question for you guys. We'll have some fun here. Let's do it. There have been 18 instances since 2001 of a player hitting 50 home runs in a season. Mm. Only one time has a player followed up a 50 home run season with another 50 home run season. Who is that player? And I'll give you a hint. It's not Sammy Sosa and it's not mm. Mark McGuire. 
since you 2001. Said since when? 2001. Since 2001. Okay. But this guy, I'll give you another hint. This guy was suspended for doing steroids. A Rod. Yep. Uh, a Rod. Nice, nice. With the Texas Rangers from 2001 to 2002. So, with that in mind, I don't, the pace that Matt Olson kept up last season was pretty insane. I mean, he was hitting eight, nine home runs a season consistently across the entire year. There is going to be some natural regression to that. He's also played 162 games in back-to-back seasons, and he's now in his 30s. I don't project him to do that again for another full season. He may do it, but it's very unlikely that he does. But even coming into last year, he hadn't hit above 40 home runs in any season in his major league career. Now, for Olsen, you know, he obviously pops off the page for all the advanced metrics from exit velocity to all these different metrics. He was number one in Major League Baseball because he obviously hit the most home runs. But if you look at where he hit those home runs and the zones that he hit them, it was very specific. Basically, half of his home runs came off the middle to middle, the bottom of the zone, like middle, bottom, middle. That was about half of his home runs. If pitchers can just stay away from those two zones for even just a stretch during the season, he's going to go way under this. And if you look at projection models, I mean, his average composite projection among all the projection models on fan graphs have him right around 40 home runs. So there's going to be some natural regression from hitting 54 home runs. The pace he kept up was insane. I don't expect him to do that again. And again, he played all 162 games. If he just misses even just a week or a little bit more time, he's going to go way under this total. So Olsen under 43 and a half. And it kind of plays into your Jordan home run leader as well, Sean, because you have Olsen who's going to have some natural regression. You have Judge who's you know battling the toe injury. Acuna who now is having this knee injury. Like there is some regression for guys who hit these massive amount of home runs. I mean, you just saw it there in Judge. He had 60 plus home runs in the next season. You know, obviously injuries took a toll, but he didn't even come more close to that. Yeah, there's actually two players on the Braves that I prefer to lead the league in home runs, Austin Riley and Acuna if he's healthy. And Acuna says he'll be in there on opening day. That was the latest update. So as of right now, Acuna going to be in there on opening day, but the Braves are going to play it safe with him throughout the season. I mean, they can't afford for him to get hurt for the playoffs. And frankly, the off seasons that the Dodgers and the Braves had, you know, everything is pointing towards what's the best team we can build for October. James Paxton, Chris Sale. These are guys you want in October, not in April. So Mm-hmm. They want Ronald Acuna Jr. in October. They're going to win the division. They have a 95% chance of winning the division. And even if Acuna is not in there, they're probably still winning that division 80% of the time. So, yeah, uh, I, I definitely prefer Riley and Acuna if I'm taking home run leader bets from the Braves. But as we talked about, Jordan Alvarez, my favorite bet in that category. I'm going to finish off with my final two picks, and then we'll toss it to BJ and Jim for their final two picks. I'm going to cover the MVP markets, my favorite picks in either market. We'll start with the National League. And Bryce Harper, this is a player I think is really being undersold by projections this season. As Jim talked about, projections tend to average out playing time, but also average out performance. You know, it's generous to players who have missed time, maybe conservative for players who play regularly. But also when a player has an injury, projection systems don't know, well, this guy was a little bit worse for part of last year because he was injured. And it's very obvious with Bryce Harper's sample 170 WRC plus in 2021, won the MVP, had a monster second half. 202 WRC plus in the second half of 2021. He was injured in 2022, posted a 139 WRC plus, had Tommy John surgery after the season. Start of last season, he said, I'm going to beat my injury timeline, come back before everyone expects. Okay, great, Bryce. Posted a 115 WRC plus in the first half. Was a shell of himself. I believe he homered three times. Second half, 166 WRC plus. 18 home runs and 300 plate appearances ahead of the power pace that he put up in 2021. So the projections calling for 25 to home, 25 to 30 home runs for Bryce this season, a 140 WRC plus, which is in line with his career average. I get why they're doing that because that's what he's posted the past couple of seasons. And that's what his career averages are. But if you isolate for the times where he's actually healthy in the past couple of years, this guy is closer to a 160 WRC plus hitter, a 170 hitter. And I think he's going to post 35 home runs, 70 extra base hits, and be well within the MVP conversation this year. Going to be playing first base, should be in the lineup regularly. Does decrease his wins above replacement a little bit because he's not playing the outfield, not getting as much credit for defensive value, but it just should make him available more regularly considering he's not going to get dinged up diving for balls. So Bryce Harper to win the NL MVP at 12 to 1. Would have liked a slightly better price, but I think that's enough to jump in. 
And then the AL MVP, BJ already talked about it, but Julio and Witt, they were your American League war leaders over the final four months of 2023. Do you watch baseball? Do you have eyes and ears? Do you pay attention to the game? Who are the two most exciting young players in the sport right now? Julio Rodriguez and Bobby Wood Jr., who both play premium defensive up the middle positions and have a chance at seven win seasons at their peak. Julio Rodriguez and Bobby Wood Jr., who are the two most exciting players for people to collect in the hobby right now? Julio Rodriguez and Bobby Wood Jr., who's going number one and number two other than Ronald Acuna in fantasy drafts? Do you want me to keep going on? Do you pay attention to baseball? This is the most obvious AL MVP choices I've ever made. Put them both on your card. Don't think too hard about it. Julio and Bobby are the future of baseball after Otani. I've said enough. BJ, tossing it back to you for pick number five. Yeah, let's go with a little buy low on a pitcher that was at one time going to be one of the most exciting young arms in baseball. Jack Flaherty, uh, over 128 and a half strikeouts. Now, this is a bet on him obviously staying healthy, which he hasn't done for a lot of seasons. But last year, he did throw 144 innings. And even if he does that this season, I know he's not a great pitcher. I know his expected area has been above five forever. But he's maintained above a 9K per 9 rate every single season. When he gets out, they're usually strikeouts. And if you look at what he's doing in spring training right now, his velocity on both his fastball and his slider is up two miles per hour. And he's maintained that from his first and his second start in spring training. So if he stays healthy with his velocity going up, and he may post another over five expected ERA. He may do that again. But he is projected to be well above a 9K per 9, right? So he's just got to throw 130 innings, and he's going to get there. So it is a bet on him staying healthy. But if he stays healthy and he just throws 130 innings, he's going to very easily hit his total. So I love Jack Flaherty over 120 and a half strikeouts to finish out my draft. Did not expect to hear the phrase, I love Jack Flaherty, <laughs> on a 2024 Player Props episode, uh, let alone to an over. If anything, I would have expected yeah. an under. But BJ, very interesting look there with your final pick. And Jim, I absolutely love your final pick. This is actually one that I had in my bonus bets of bets that I might have given out. I got this bet down at 120 to 1. Hitting lead off to start the season. I think there's a chance, though, at some point, the Phillies are struggling. Maybe Kyle Schwarber moves down into the middle of the lineup and gives this bet a chance to cash Kyle Schrober RBI leader for the season at 100 to one. Yeah, I originally had uh, another player prop here, another you know minus 110, minus money. I was like, you know what? This is the the Mr. Irrelevant pick. I got to make this fun. I gotta I gotta spice it up. Throwing a throwing a little long shot here. So went went to the Kyle Schwarber RBI uh, league leader bet as you mentioned, 100 to one. Um, and on the surface, it does seem absurd. He's a leadoff hitter who hits sub 200. How is this guy ever going to lead the league in RBIs? Well, he was a leadoff hitter who hit sub 200 last season, and he finished 11th in the league in RBI. Now, I think his floor is much better than his ceiling, which is part of the reason why you get this number. But he is a guy who has stayed in the lineup. Uh, he's incredibly healthy. His power is incredibly consistent. And, you know, we, we I referenced that 197 batting average last year. And, you know, there was some bad luck to that. Now, maybe part of that bad luck is he's Kyle Schwarber and looks and runs like Kyle Schwarber. And maybe he's not going to post the greatest BABIPs or XBAs uh, out there. Um, however, I do think, as you pointed out, there's a the, the ceiling on this bet is a move down the lineup. And I don't think it's impossible to see him move a little bit further down the lineup. And the bat X, again, I've, I've referenced it twice so far. My favorite projection system has him projected second in RBI right now. Now, I think, you know, a lot of that is to do to the floor. I think he has incredibly high floor of this, but that's that can be good. If you if you make this bet at 100 to one and he's in the top two or three, that's a pretty easy piece to leverage, at, you know, at the All-Star game if they post this this prop back up. So, uh, you know, it seems like a ridiculous bet. And at 100 to one, you know, it is a little bit of a ridiculous bet, but I thought it was a fun way to take us home. Uh, Kyle Schwarber to lead the league in RBIs at 100 to one. It's not ridiculous at all. I haven't projected seventh. I mean, just yeah. look at, you know, this is how I handicap these categories, right? Bucket players or fine players whose player, players they're projected around, their line makes no sense amongst, right? Aaron Judge, Matt Olson, Jordan, Pete, Austin Riley, all 13 to one or lower to finish as the RBI leader. Then I have Schwarber at 120 to one, <laughs> and then Otani at 10 to one. Which number stands out compared to the rest of that group? So yes, the floor is lower because he's hitting leadoff, but also there may be pressure to move him down the lineup at some point. I think another player who's interesting for this category at triple digit odds too. And I want to mention him here because our long shots episode is going to be airing much closer to 
for that opening Korea series between the Dodgers and Padres. Teoscar Hernandez, for very similar reasons, at 125 to 1. May play every day for the Dodgers. Currently slated by roster resource to hit seventh. But Will Smith is the only other righty that they really have who has power that can hit in the middle of that lineup. And on days where Smith isn't batting cleanup or when they're playing against lefties, I expect Teoscar to be hitting in the middle of that lineup, breaking up the lefties that they have with Freeman and Otani and Muncy and Outman. So Teoscar Hernandez, to me, massive lineup upside to jump up into that cleanup spot, to play every day, and at 125-1 to on the team that may score the most or second most runs in baseball. I think Teoscar is going to be right in the thick of things and bashing in a lot of runners in scoring position. So that'll do it for us for now, but we're going to have much more content for you coming out over the next couple of weeks. As I said, divisional previews, a long shots episode, and maybe some of our favorite picks. That'll do it for us on Payoff Pitch presented by BetMGM. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so that you don't miss an episode. Thank you to BJ Cunningham. Thank you to Jim Turvey. Make sure to check out our new episodes during the season on Monday, Wednesday, or Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. Make sure to download the award-winning free Action Network app where you can find all of our futures for the 2024 season. 